Well, we're going to get into the Word of God today, but before we do, we always need to take a moment to pray so that we can open our hearts fully to what the Lord wants to say to us today. Let's pray. Father, in the name of Jesus, we thank you because we know that your word is life. And so, Father, today, may you breathe upon us and, and awaken new life within us so that we can be more like you. In Jesus' name I do pray. Come on, everybody shouts, amen and amen. Well, listen, today we're going to Matthew. Matthew, the Gospel of Matthew, the first book of the New Testament, chapter 11, and we're going to take verses 18 and 19. I'm going to share it from the New International Version, the NIV version, uh, but we're going to Matthew chapter 11, verses 18 and 19. Whatever copy of the Bible you have is fine. Here's what the Word of the Lord says uh, in Matthew chapter 11, verses 18 and 19. For John came, John came, neither eating nor drinking, and they say, he has a demon. The Son of Man came, Jesus came, eating and drinking, and they say he's a glutton and a drunkard, a friend of tax collectors and sinners. But wisdom is proved right by her deeds. Wisdom is proved right by her deeds. I want to preach under the sermon title, What Do You Expect? What do you expect? Well, I got a question for you. How many of you out there still create a Christmas list? Uh, come on, just be honest. Don't, 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 don't try to, don't try to uh, 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 shy away from the truth right now. How many of you can still create a tr Christmas list? I, 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 I've, I've kind of gotten out of that habit, but you know, sometimes every now and again, I'll have one or two things on my mind that I may want to hold off to the Christmas season to get for myself or, or, or uh, slyly suggest to my wife that there's something that I want. But, but you can, if, if you don't create a Christmas list now, you, you might remember when you were a child and you were real serious about what was on your Christmas list. All the things that you wanted, that toy car, that special doll, that, that unique little uh, doll house or, or that, that new video game. There were those things on your list that you really, really wanted. And, and I want to ask you, what happened when you didn't get what was on your list? What, what happened when, when, the, when, when mommy or daddy didn't actually provide to you what you anticipated they would provide? Did, did, you, did you protest in childlike anger and throw a temper tantrum? Did you, did you hang your head and, 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 and just pout and wish, wish that somehow this situation would be changed? Did you uh, accept the reality and, and accept the fact that you don't always get what you want? What was your response to your uh, Christmas list not being fulfilled. Maybe some of you don't even know because you've never had the, the experience of writing something on your list and it not being granted to you. But, but if you've lived long enough, it, we can be honest that maybe it's not a Christmas list, maybe it's a goal list, maybe it's a, maybe it's a financial list, maybe it's a career list, but, but there's lists that we develop in our lives and as we go throughout our journey, we can admit that sometimes we arrive at milestones in our journey in life and things on our list are not met. There's things that we don't receive that we expected to receive at certain milestones. And my question to you is, how do you respond to that? How do you respond particularly to the feeling that Jesus has not provided to you what you thought he would provide? How do you respond to the fact that you have prayed, that you have, you have sought the Lord, you have gone to church, you have, you have given your tithe and offering, you have participated in ministry, you have engaged in loving kindness and acts of service to others, and, and you think that once you have done those things and you created your list, and surely the God that you serve and the God that provides blessings would, would, would meet the expectations of your list. So when Jesus doesn't meet those expectations, how, how do you respond? How do you show up? What is, your, what is your engagement with God? See, this is the season where, where we, we are reminded, as I mentioned last week, that, that this, is, this is the time we were reminded that Jesus came down. 
He came down to earth. And it's a story that we tell with, with beauty. It's a story that we tell uh, with, with, with illustrations and, 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 and artistry that brings to life this wonderful gift that God gave to all humanity in the birth of his son. We, we tell it with beauty. We tell it with majesty. majesty. We tr- tell it with artistry. But, but if we're honest, if we're honest, Jesus coming down didn't meet everybody's expectations. It, and, and in fact, when we think about Jesus coming into our lives, if we're honest, we, we, we have some expectations that we have had for God in our journey with him that haven't always been met. We, we expected him to fill our souls and keep us in peace and keep us joyful and keep us filled with blessings. But, but we have to admit that we've gone through times in our lives where it doesn't feel like when Jesus has come into our lives, it's produced the results that we expected. And I want to suggest to you from this passage today that that is in large part because what we expect of God is not actually consistent with the way that he wants to operate in our lives. I know that's a little hard, but we got we to gotta admit that. And, 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 and we can see that here in the story that is told in Matthew, because when Jesus comes into this earth, he does not meet the expectations. He does not uh, uh, arrive at the, the point of, 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 of expectation or expectancy that the people living during that time had for him. And we got to admit that too, that, that sometimes Jesus doesn't present himself in the way that we expect it. And I want to suggest to you that that is with intentionality. That, that God's part of God's plan, God, God, part of God's plan in our lives and in the world is to disrupt the norms that we have, right? Like Jesus didn't just come to be a friend. He, he is a friend. Jesus didn't just come to be a provider. He is a provider. Jesus didn't come to just be a, a way maker. He is a way maker. But Jesus also came, hear me, to disrupt some of the norms that actually keep us from experiencing the fullness of who he is. And right here in this passage of scripture, we can see that to be true. Jesus is engaging in this dialogue. The whole chapter of Matthew 11 is actually beautiful because John has started to get a little restless and wonders whether or not this Jesus is actually the one, the Messiah that they've been praying for, or if they should expect another. And so he sends some people to to find out, hey, Jesus, we just want to check in. Are you really the one or, or are we looking for another? And Jesus says, look, just tell John that 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 you saw sight being given to the blind that 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 hearing is restored that the sick are healed that the dead are raised to life that's the evidence that you need to give to John that all is well I'm in control I'm just disrupting some norms so that the people who have been kept out of the kingdom can actually make it in And that's what we see going on here when Jesus now turns from talking to the people that John sent, the disciples of John, that he sent to inquire of the Lord. Now Jesus turns to the rest of the crowd and he begins to talk about John as this great prophet. He says there's none other, no other human that was better than him. Uh, And then he goes on to say, he goes on to say, but I've got a problem with this generation. You guys are looking at John and and you had certain expectations of him and he has certain expectations of me, but I've got a problem with this generation and and I want to share with you what that problem is. And I'm going to go to verse 16 to show you what Jesus says about this generation and how he begins to disrupt the norms of the generation. Here's what he says. To what can I compare this generation? They are like children sitting in the marketplaces and calling out to others. And listen what the children say. We played the pipe for you and you did not dance. We sang a dirge for you and you did not mourn. 
What are they saying there? What they're saying is, is that Jesus is comparing the children, the, that generation. He's comparing that generation to how people are responding to him and to John the Baptist. He's like, you guys are like children. We, we, we sang, we, we played a, uh, a pipe for you. That's a, that's a instrument of celebration. In fact, the pipe was used in wedding feasts of that time. So he was alluding to, we played the pipe for you. We have given you joy. We we have given you, uh, we have given you uh, something to celebrate. We've given you something to appreciate, and you did not dance. You didn't, uh, you didn't value it. We, we came along and gave you blessing, and you looked on it as if it was a curse. Then he goes on to say, when you were in your low time, we played a dirge for you. We played funeral music so that you could mourn appropriately, but you then didn't want to mourn. He's like, we've been on both ends of the spectrum giving to you what, what we believe to be the things that you have requested, the things that were on your list. We gave them to you. We have provided them to you and you still did not respond with appreciation, gratitude, and thanksgiving. I, I want to just pause right there because if any of you have children out there, you will know one of the most frustrating things is, is that, that when you give your children gifts, right? Let's just come on, be honest with me, right? When you give your children's, children gifts, they may enjoy it for a moment, but then they go on often to want the next thing or wonder why they didn't, they got this, but they didn't get that. And you have to teach your children, right, how to appreciate what they have and how to value what they have. And, and I believe that that is also what Jesus is, is attempting to do here. He's like, look, I need to put the pause button on right here because, because you, have, you have requested one thing and that was granted. Then you requested another thing and that was granted and you're still unhappy. And this is where he then adds with specificity what his real problem is with the generation. He says, for John came neither eating nor drinking and you said he had a demon. I came and I ate and I drank, and then you said that I was a, a glutton and a, and a drunker and a friend of tax collectors and sinners. It's important for you to get this right here that Jesus is literally trying to, 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 to fashion for them the, 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 the problem and the presentation that they continue to give back to Jesus. And I want to just pause right here in the message and just ask you, how are you responding to Jesus. Uh, 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 how are you responding to him? You know, there's times when we have prayed for one thing and, 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 and maybe in the moment when it is granted, we say, thank you, Jesus. But the very next moment, we're asking for something else. So, or we have, we have asked him to work out this situation in a particular way and, and God works it out and maybe even does things that we don't expect. And then the next time we get in that same or similar situation, we forget what he had done in the past. It feels like what Jesus is saying is, when will you ever be satisfied? When, when will you ever appreciate? When will you ever value what I bring to the table? Instead, instead of valuing it, what I hear is, what I feel is, what I see is a generation that cannot be, be satisfied no matter what I do. And I want to push back against that spirit in this holiday season, right? I want to push back against that, 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 that if God doesn't do another thing, he has already done enough. But I want to push it even further because I believe Jesus doesn't just come to disrupt a norm so that he can get more accolade, more accolades, more praise and more adoration. I don't think he just does it for that. I believe that he comes to disrupt the norm because it is actually keeping us from being able to receive the full manifestation of who we can be in Christ. Because when we look at this, this, this challenge and this rebuke that is given to the, the, the listeners when Jesus is giving this sermon, if we look at what, 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 what is really being said, we kind of pull up the hood and go under the hood and look at what Jesus is saying. Man, it's a great challenge to the whole Jewish culture and the whole religious institution that existed during that time. And if you just give me a little bit of latitude, I promise to explain this and then we'll be done. 
But, but, I, but I think it's critical because Jesus is not just disrupting the norms so that he can get more praise. He's disrupting the norms in the beauty of, in the only beautiful way that Jesus could do it. He is disrupting the norms so that we can actually have a greater benefit of living life within him. Okay, you got to get this. So here it is. He says, you asked you said you complained about John because he wasn't eating and drinking. And then you complained about me because I was eating and drinking. When will you ever be satisfied? But what is really critical here is something I want to share from you from this scholar. There's almost uh, 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 this uh, uh, obscure scholar that that wrote this this beautiful explanation of what's going on in this and what what Jesus, the imagery that Jesus is using uh, uh, from Jewish culture to make this challenge to those who are listening. And it's uh, the scholar's last name is Bart Chi, Bart Chi. And here's what he says. He says the principle here when he's talking about Jesus sharing this meal, right? When Jesus is sitting down with tax collectors, he's eating and drinking, he's engaging with sinners, he's laying down at the publican's house and having a party, right? Jesus is engaging in culture. And what Bart Bart Chi says is that the simple principle here is that to share a meal is to share life. To share a meal, is to, in Jewish culture, to share a meal was to share life. And meals meant fellowship, acceptance, and identity between friends. So if we're sitting at the same table, if, if we're fellowshipping together, we're sharing a meal, that, may, that's not, that was not a casual thing in Jewish culture. It meant, it meant that we were, we, were, we were connected in relationship, that, that I had accepted you and you had accepted me, and that there was a shared identity and a shared journey and a shared belief between us. So the, the obvious the obvious uh, inference from that is, is that if we're not at the same table, then there isn't something to share. He goes on to say, social values and hierarchical boundaries controlled such occasions. Anyone, watch this, who challenged these rankings and boundaries would be judged to have acted dishonorably. A serious change in cultural cultures based on the values of honor and shame. In other words, Jesus was doing stuff that did not fit within the cultural milieu, the cultural context. And in that culture, if you were to walk outside of those boundaries, then you were seriously challenging that culture that was built on honor and shame. Mm, it's good, it's good. But it continues, transgressing these customs consistently would make a person an enemy of social stability. I got to keep reading. I know it's a little complex, but stick with me here. There was a close link between purity, watch this, in terms of food laws and purity in terms of companions at meals. Pharisees regarded their tables at home as surrogates for the Lord's altar in the temple in Jerusalem and therefore strove to maintain their households and among their eating companions, the state of ritual purity required of priest in the temple service. Whoa, it's going so good. It's so good. In other words, what he's saying is they had gotten so uh, restrictive with this practice of ensuring that only those sitting at their table were those that were just like them and those that shared the same beliefs and those that they had accepted, that they treated their dining room table as if it was equivalent to the Lord's altar in the temple. And so anyone who was not part of them could not sit at their table or else their table would be defiled. Ooh, come on, you gotta get this. It's so, it's so critical. They were, they were keeping people out because they believed that these individuals were not in lockstep and not walking in congruence with the same ways of thinking, the same ways of believing, the same ways of acting as them. And Jesus is like, I gotta upset the apple cart. Jesus is like, I gotta, I gotta, I gotta fix this thing because, because what was going on, what you, what you miss, what you miss 
is that is that you are now excluding some of the very people that I want to come in and be part of my kingdom. You're, 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 you're keeping them out. And so Jesus disrupts the norms with this very, not only this simple statement, but with his life, he disrupts the norm in at least three ways that I want to share with you. And then I'm going to move on because, because this idea of this table and us creating space for only those things or those people that are in, can, in line with what we believe and how we think, I think is a challenge that I think God wants to disrupt not only 2,000 years ago, but also today. And so here it is. Here it is. The first thing I believe that Jesus is disrupting, the first norm I believe he's disrupting, and we've already kind of uh, spoken of it, but I want to put a fine point on it, and that is the, the norm of fellowship, right? The norm of fellowship. I believe that God was trying to break down this, 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 this way of engaging in relationship because it was defeating the very goal that he had for his children. Uh, I, I want you to see it this way. I want, I want you to see it this way, that that, that that when we look at at this idea of sitting at the table and only allowing those who look like us, act like us, talk like us, think like us, go to the same church as us, live in the same neighborhood as us, eat like us, uh, uh, though when we when we think of it that we're only allowing those people at the table, I think the problem is is that we somehow believe that our religion. And our spirituality is then better than others, uh, than, than that of others. We, we begin to, to believe and we begin to convince ourselves that somehow the walk that we're walking and the journey that we're having is better than somebody who may not be having the exact same kind of journey as us. And that's what was going on in this particular time in Earth's history and within this particular religious sect. And you probably say to yourself, well, Pastor, I don't feel like that. I don't feel like I'm, I'm better than somebody or that only certain people can sit at my table or they have to think like me or act like me or be like me in order to come and sit down. You may say that to yourself, but I want you to just think for just a second here and explore some of the ways Ways that within our fellowship, our fellowship has become very narrow. It has become very restrictive. It has become it has become very very limited in the way that we uh, seek to invite others into our space. And and the truth is, if we're going to really be honest about this, it's not just the result. It's not just what's happening in the church, but it's going on all over society. All over society, we see how how I only want to deal with people who talk like me and think like me and look like me and act like me and go where I go and, 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 and love what I love and hate what I hate. Right. I, I think that we have gotten to this point in society, not only in the church, but in society as well, where it's just it is it has become a norm to just be with those who are like us. Right. And I want to I want to suggest that Jesus push back against this idea primarily because it keeps us, watch this, all three points land on this one thing. It keeps us from fully being able to experience the blessing and the full manifestation of living life in Christ. Hear me clearly, hear me clearly. When we are only fellowshipping, listening to, uh, uh, engaging with people who affirm the ideas that we already have, it limits our ability to see Christ in his fullness. Christ is a is, is like a diamond. Come on, somebody, that every time you turn it, you see a dip. Every time you turn his character, every time you turn his scripture, every time you turn the experiences that you've had with him and you can under and you understand him on a greater way, you see a new prism, you see a new reflection, you see a, a, a new brilliance that comes through every time you see Christ from a different angle. Even when you're listening to people who actually are in who, who are in disagreement with your position. Come on, somebody. When we begin to only hear those who talk like us, look like us, believe like us, we actually prevent ourselves from seeing Christ in the fullness, in the beauty of who he truly is. And I believe that's what God was saying. He was like, y'all Jewish folks, 
are, 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 are keeping people out uh, and only want to fellowship amongst yourselves. And that is actually part of the reason why you haven't been able to recognize who I am. I showed up. I came down and you are now fighting against me. You weren't pleased with John with all that he brought to the table. So I came and I came with a, a different approach and you're still not pleased with me. You, you can't see me. You can't accept me. You can't experience me because you have only been listening to yourselves. And I need you, if you're going to really be, walk with me, if you're going to experience the blessings that I have for you, if you're going to be able to live the life I have for you, then I need you to understand that I'm bigger than your religious sect. I'm bigger than your small community. I'm bigger than your friend group. I'm bigger than your denominational tradition. I'm bigger than the, the experiences that you have had to date. And I want you to know that if you're going to grow, then you got to let you got to let some other folks in. You got to let some other some other challenges in and begin to walk on this journey with me. First norm, I believe that Jesus is disrupting is the norm of fellowship. He wanted more participation in the table of religious life. Second thing, I believe that uh, Jesus is disrupting is the norm of exclusivity. Come on, somebody. Yeah, yeah, yeah. See, see, we, we, we in, in this particular culture, in Jewish culture, there were those who were believed to have the rights to sit at the table. There were those who believed to, to have the, 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 the authority to sit at the table. There were those who were believed to, to be the, the ones who were, had the, the, the lineage to sit at the table, who had the hierarchy to sit at the table, who had the prestige and the pedig pedigree to sit at the table, right? So, so, so Jesus is like, no, I didn't just come for, for those. I came for the, the, the sinner and the, the tax collector and the, 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 the homeless person and the rich person and the educated person and the uneducated person. I, I, I came for all. And so what I want you to get is, is that this, this idea that, that you, must, you must keep out in order to preserve what you have. Oh my, I, I, want you to, I want you to get it. I want you to get it that, that somehow that you are going to be able to, to fend off uh, all of that which would try to come and 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 contaminate you. You're go you're gonna stay pure by not being engaging with those who are beyond your little group. I want I want to just push back on that because what Jesus is saying is no, I didn't just come so that I could save those who believed they were already in. I came so that I could actually reach those who never thought they could get in. I, I, I came to get those who, who, have been, who have been pushed out by so many rules and so many ideas that they can't even begin to hear me. I came to sit and reorder and reorient those who would think that, that the God that they've heard about has no value to them. I came to reach those that would be able to experience a kind of a fellowship with me uh, and, and would not be excluded from that fellowship, but rather would be included. I came to get them so that they would know that, that what they might have seen, watch this, what they might have seen about me does not match the reality of who I am. And I want to push back against somebody because I believe, I believe that, that there, are, there are those in our society that have had lists about what church should be about how God should be, about how uh, uh, the, 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 the work and the, the journey of being a Christian should be. Uh, and, and as a result of the ways that they have been excluded from conversation and opportunity to engage in some of the challenges and questions that they have, they have now said, well, you know what? This God must not be for me. I, I, don't, I don't look I don't look the part. I, I'm clearly not acting the part. I, I, I'm clearly not uh, 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 being received as 
part of those who consider themselves uh, on the end. And, and so since I'm not acting the part, I don't look the part, I don't sound the part, I, I must not be part of that group that God has actually come to say. So instead, I'm just going to live my life how I feel it. I'm going to just going to just be how I want to be. And I want to I want to I want to say, look, I, while I'm not excusing that kind of thinking, I am also suggesting that for those of us who say we are at the table, that we are we are part of God's kingdom. It is incumbent upon us to say, no, 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 no. We, we, we didn't get to the table because we have a pred pedigree. We didn't get to the table because we have a certain uh, level of, of uh, speciality or, 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 or prestige. We didn't get to the table because there's something good in us. No, we got to the table because God of, um, uh, opened up a chair at the table. He, he, he saw that the res reservation list was full. And he said, you know what? I'm going to clear the reservation list so that one more of my child, my children can get to the table. I'm going to, I'm going to open up another seat. I'm going to open up another table. I'm going to expand the table so that more of my children can get in. And I believe there are many that have, have left and many that have gone on from the church because they didn't fit the part. They didn't look the part. They didn't act the part. And, 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 and we as a body of believers didn't do the best that we could to say, no, what? You don't have to, you don't have to act the part, look the part, be the part. No, instead, what we want you to, what we want you to do is to fall in love with Jesus. We want to show you what it is to live life in him, to be part of his kingdom, to walk with him in strength, to trust him when you can't trace him, to have courage even when you feel confused. Uh, we want to show you, and, and look, I want to, we want to be honest with you, there's going to be some days you ain't going to get it right. There's going to be some days you're going to fall and you're going to slip up. But I want you to know you can still come back to the table. You, you, can, still, uh, you can still have a seat. Uh, amongst us, right? You may you may have a different approach to the way that you want to engage in worship. You may have a different approach to the way that you even read the word. You may have a different approach to the way that you understand the work that is to be done in the community, but we want you to understand you're welcome at this table and we want to hear and we want to understand and we want to grow because somewhere in that, hear me, somewhere in that journey, of saying, you know what, we are not exclusive, but we are inclusive. Somewhere in that, we actually see a better picture of Jesus. Come on, somebody. We actually see a better reality of his grace. We actually see a better de de depiction of, of what he has always planned for his people. Somewhere in there, we see a greater expression of his love. Somewhere in there, we see a greater way to reach the lost. Somewhere in that journey of inclusivity, we actually arrive at a place of understanding God in ways that we had not understood before. So Jesus comes, he says, look, I know you got this tradition where, where you're sitting at, at, at the table only with these few folks, but I want you to understand that you, you're, you're calling me a, a drunkard and you're calling me a glutton, but no, I, I, that's not what I'm doing. I'm disrupting the norm of fellowship. I'm disrupting the norm of exclusivity. And the last thing I'm doing is I'm disrupting the norm of accessibility. I'm disrupting the norm of accessibility. Come on, come on, come on. Watch, watch what he says. Watch what he says. He says, he says, you called me a glutton and a drunkard, but watch this, watch this. But wisdom is proved right by her deeds. I, I wanted to share this, all of this just to get to this one point. Wisdom is proved right by her deeds. I, I, I want you to get this, that what, the, what he's saying there is that, is that there is all of this, this wisdom, particularly in Proverbs, but all throughout scripture, but particularly in Proverbs, this is wisdom, wisdom about how to live life. And, and what he's suggesting is that if that wisdom is true, that when you apply it, you will, you will see the value in it, right? Wisdom is proved right by her deeds. When you put it into practice, when you begin to operate on that level, when you begin to engage with that idea of wisdom, you're going to see that it's going to produce something better in you and something better in the community that you are part of. Get this in the house of God today, right? So when Jesus comes, he's like, look, you think you are on the journey because you, you have all of the information, but I want to show you that, that I'm trying to give you access 
to some benefits that you can only receive when you're walking in the wisdom that is only found in me. Get this, get this, get this. When Jesus shows up, he is the personification. He is the fulfillment of all wisdom. And some, in fact, some people even want to suggest that there is a wisdom Christology. And I, and I, I, don't, I don't have time to, to go into that. But what I do want to suggest here is, is that he is the fulfillment of all wisdom. So when we look at Jesus and we see him in, enacting the wisdom that we see all throughout scripture, and we see that over and over in his life, when his list, watch this, of things didn't add up, especially when he got to the Garden of Gethsemane. But, but even before we get there, when we see his list of things did not add up, what things that would have crushed us, things that were expectations that, that were not met, that would have totally destroyed us, Jesus consistently finds a way to navigate that aspect of his life and get access to power and get access to strength and get access to wisdom that allows him to make it through situations that would kill you and I. And I want you to get this. I want you to get this today because because I believe Jesus is saying, I know you expected things to go one way. I know you expected your life to go this way. I know you expected to be in a different place by now. I know you expected 2020 to look different than it has. I know you expected your, your, your marriage to be different. I know you expected your finances to be different. I know you expected your children to be different. I know you expected your singleness to be different. I know you expected your job to be different. I know you expected your journey in the church to be different. I know you expected your time of devotion to be different. I know you expected all of the things that have been on your list to be different. But I want you to understand the thing that I came to disrupt is not that I was going to fix all the things in your life so that no, there was no pain and no stress. But I came to show you how to access wisdom so that when your job doesn't go the way that you expect it to go, you will have the ability to respond in ways that don't crush you but build you so that when your children are acting the way that you expect them to act and they're not becoming all that you thought they could become I have I have given you access to wisdom so that you know how to pour into their lives so that maybe a word after 20 years maybe a word after 30 or 40 years will somehow speak to them and they'll begin to change their tra trajectory I didn't come to fix everything and make it all perfect no what I came is so that when you are going through that time and you're trying to figure out how you're going to make ends meet you're trying to figure out how the finances are all going to come together, how you're going to be able to navigate this particular moment and get through over this financial hurdle. I came so that you may be able to have wisdom, access to wisdom, so that you can begin to, to order your finances in ways so that this time of struggle, then this time of challenge is only a season that becomes an opportunity for you to testify how the Lord has brought you over the season. I want somebody to get this out there today is that Jesus is like, no, I didn't come so that everything could be neat and nice and perfect and prim and pe No, no, no. What I came to so is that no matter what the experience looks like, whether you are walking through betrayal of friends, whether you are at the Garden of Gethsemane crying your eyes out because you can't feel me, I came so that you could have wisdom, so that you could access wisdom, so that you could be able to navigate those moments in your life and not lose your faith and not lose your hope and not lose your courage and not lose your ability to stay on your knees and keep praying and not lose your ability to say, God, though he slay me, yet will I trust him. I may have to go through some challenges, but I'm not giving up my relationship. I may be down a few days. I may be wondering where God is for a few moments, but I'm quickly going to turn that corner and find my, myself back in the arms of Jesus because I have learned that if I'm going to get through life, it's not going to be because I got I got strength. It's not going to be because I got talent. It's not going to be because I got intelligence. So no, it's going to be because God has given me access to divine wisdom that will allow me to deal with every single situation in our lives. And what he's saying is, please do not miss out on wisdom because you are trying to maintain a norm that is actually blocking you from receiving what I have designed for you. I want you to get this, that the truth is that we can complain a lot about God 
I know about all the things that haven't happened the way that we thought they would. Hey, we can, we can complain about what, what has gone our way and what things didn't make it on our list. But that's why I started the sermon by asking, what did you expect? Oh, did you just expect for God to just be a, a God who comes down to, to do, to meet all of the, your needs perfectly and, 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 just, and just make sure that there was never any struggle in this life? Well, here's what I do know. Here's what I do know is that, is that, that the needs that we truly have, he does meet perfectly, but, but sometimes we don't realize that our greatest need is not for him to fix a situation, but our greatest need is for him to guide us through a situation. I want to I want to I want to I want to ask you what did you what did you what did you expect for this generation in this passage they they expected Jesus to to show up and 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 right the ship of authority and make them a kingdom again. But Jesus said, "No, I didn't come to make you a you a kingdom. I came to build my kingdom so that many could be brought into the saving knowledge of Jesus Christ. Maybe the problem is our expectations are off. Maybe the problem is the list needs to be changed. Maybe the problem is, is that we need to reorder our priorities. Maybe the problem is that we have created a journey with Jesus that is actually pushing him farther away rather than bringing him close into every experience in our lives. I want to challenge you with that today, that, that there is an opportunity, come on somebody, there is an opportunity to not just keep doing life with God the same way you've done it, but, but, but to experience something greater. In fact, I want to challenge you to suggest that the reason why Jesus came was so that he could not just change you get this sometimes the key to changing us is changing the traditions the behaviors and the habits that have kept Jesus from actually accessing our hearts and I want to suggest to you today that the full manifestation of who Christ is what it really means to live a life in Christ it requires us to allow Jesus to disrupt some of our norms and traditions so that he can create something new. Oh, I, I, I pray that, that today you, you, you lean into that. I pray that today that you can, you can accept that. I pray that today you can say, you know what, God, all, all right, I, I, I've, I've, been, I've been doing this, doing this the same old, same old way for far too long. I gotta allow you to adjust the way that I engage in fellowship, to, to, to ensure that I'm not, I'm not being overly exclusive and trying to, to keep myself pure so that I can be uh, 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 untouched and un, 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 undefiled by the world. Oh, don't get me wrong. I, I'm not suggesting that we go out and participate in all kinds of lewd activity. That's not my point. My point is, is that we are, are called to be salt and light in a dark world. And I'll tell you that there's a lot that we can learn when we're willing to say, you know what? I'm going to, I'm going to do my part to, to be light in this dark space. I'm going to do my part to, to be salt in this, in, in this environment. And, and you know how I'm going to do that? I'm going to access wisdom, right? I'm going to access wisdom for my life and for the places that Jesus calls me to. So I'm praying today that you say, you know what, God, disrupt my norms. My expectations have been off. My, my list has been corrupt. I need you to do something new with it. Well, if you're ready to just say, God, help me to let you <laughs> disrupt my norms. Help me to, to get into a space where some of these things that I have, I have created in my life, Lord, that I'll surrender them to you so that you can tear them down and rebuild in me something better. I want to pray for you right now. If you can say today, Lord, I want you to disrupt my norms and create a new reality in my life. Will you bow your heads with me? Father, in the name of Jesus, Lord, we thank you because you do all things well. And God, in this moment and in this season, I do believe that you are calling us to a higher level. Lord, we can't stay here. We can't stay in this place where nothing is satisfactory. 
Lord, you show up and we're happy for the moment, but then we move on and uh, we're on to something else. We're, 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 we're on to, to desiring something else. Lord, help us to begin to see life not as a series of events that need to be fixed, but rather as a journey with you, Lord, where we can learn more about who you are at every stage of the journey. Not only learn about you, but we can become more like you at every stage of the journey. Lord, that's the ultimate prayer. That's why you came to disrupt norms. You're not just trying to, 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 to cause catastrophe or strife for the sake of it. No, Lord, you want us to be more like you. And so, Father, I pray that prayer today for everybody who's under the sound of my voice, who's listening right now, who has journeyed through this word as challenging as it may have been at times. God, I pray that, Lord, that is what we will lean into today. Lord, this calling and this urging from the Spirit to become more like you. Guide our lives, Heavenly Father. In Jesus' name I do pray. Come on, everybody shouts, amen and amen. Hey, thanks so much for watching. I pray that you were blessed by this message. We'd love to connect with you beyond this moment. So I wanna invite you to subscribe to our YouTube channel. Um, you'll get updates on when a new sermon is posted as well as when we go live during our worship experiences uh, on Saturdays at 12 p.m. Uh, also, you can connect with us on social media. You can go to Facebook or Instagram and look for Miracle City Church. And on Twitter, you can find us at Miracle City Life. We really do believe that God's doing something special in this congregation and in this family. And we're so blessed that you've chosen um, to connect with us. And if you've been blessed and you want to be a blessing, we invite you to go to our website. You can find all the information for giving there by going to miraclecitychurch.org slash give. And we know the Lord will bless you for your generosity. Thank so much for being part of what God is doing here. And we pray many blessings on your life.